There has been some changes in the schedule. I mean, the first half is fine, but after lunch, uh, so since um, we have unfortunately not been able to have Professor Mario um, Di Bono come because of, uh, you know, like the Indian Embassy again came good and, uh, you know, delayed his visa for an enormously long time. So uh, Professor Mario Di Bono has not been able to come. So um, what we have done is that we have advanced all the talk slots. I, I hope that it's okay with you, Vilu. Yeah, so uh, uh, after Madhu's talk, uh, 25, there's a talk by Professor Vilo Marik, and after that, there's tea, and then from 4 to 4.45, there's a talk by Nivedi Tachadiji, uh, followed by the INCNE meeting between 4.45 and 5.30, and the poster session would be between 5.30 and 7, exactly the same as yesterday. All right, so I hope that uh, all of you have got the new schedule, so it was distributed. If you don't, uh, Janaki has extra copies of the schedule, so, so she can uh, give you one. All right, so uh, before I start the uh, and, uh, ha session and hand over the mic to the session chair, let me again remind you that please hand me over your uh, travel support forms, uh, those of you, uh, especially those of you who are supposed to leave today. I mean, we need them immediately to you know start processing them. All right, so uh, without further ado, um, let me hand over the mic to the session chair, Mother Sutan Venkatesan from NCBS Bangalore. So uh, we, we'll get started right away with Kathy Rankin, who's going to tell us about, I guess, a parallel processing experiment involving 508 experiments. I, I'm probably more aware 508 came from. Uh, and, and for the speakers, a quick word. I have a buzzer at uh, 35 minutes and ring bell once and a 40 minutes to another. Uh, so we'll roughly Thank you. Thank you, um, and I'd like to thank the organizers for this inf invitation for this wonderful meeting. Uh, and I'm first up of the C. elegans researchers, so I'm going to try to give you a little orientation to C. elegans at the start of my talk. Uh, I'm actually a psychologist, and the question that I started my research career with was how do brains change as a result of experience? And that translated into how does learning change the brain? And uh, I am a reductionist by nature, and so I started with the simplest form of learning in the simplest animal I could get. And 25 years later, I'm beginning to get some insights into how that learning uh, is mediated. So the very simplest forms of learning, imagine you are designing an organism and this organism is trying to function in the world and this organism has a whole lot of different sensory inputs. So if you think about yourself, you've got visual input, you've got sound input, there's both my voice, there's the sound of the air conditioner, there's the sound of the people around you, there is, um, you have touch receptors that are feeling your clothes, if you're wearing eyeglasses, there's the feeling of your eyeglasses, there's the rim of your eyeglasses. If you were to try to attend to every stimulus your sensory ex system is experiencing, you would have a uh, complete inability to function. So the very first level of plasticity is being able to the sensory system, to say to it, oh, that's not important, we can ignore that so that we have attentional resources that we can devote to the things that matter. Things that predict something good is coming, coming, something bad is coming. Whereas the things that are repeated and constant background things, we can tune that channel down. And that's what habituation is. So a habituation curve, you start at a baseline level and as the stimulus is repeated, response amplitude gets smaller and smaller. The other kind of non-associative learning is sensitization, where the responses are baseline level and then some stimulus, you have a close call when you're driving. Not that that would ever happen here in India, I can see. But you have a facilitation, an increase above baseline. Now, this curve, the habituation curve, you could see that it could also describe motor fatigue. That's exactly what the response would look like if the organism was getting uh, fatigued or if sensory adaptation was occurring. 
those of us who are interested in learning aren't interested in studying adaptation or fatigue. So there's several ways we distinguish the decrease in responding due to habituation from adaptation or fatigue, and that is if we give a stimulus, if you are fatigued and you get a strong stimulus, it doesn't matter. Your muscles are still fatigued. You can't use those muscles until time has gone by. Same with adaptation. If you've undergone sensory adaptation, the only thing that allows you to respond again is time. In contrast with dishabituation, even though your response level is very low, if some st sudden stimulus comes, you will suddenly attend. If you think about um, uh, the example I use in my classes is if there's uh, an insect on the little hairs of your arm, normally we ignore stimuli on the little hairs. We've got constant stimuli occurring there. But if some kind of particularly dangerous insect is there and you've slapped it and gotten rid of it and been upset about it, now suddenly for the next little while you're looking at those little hairs because you're suddenly very aware of anything touching those hairs. That's dishabituation and it's used to differentiate habituation from adaptation or fatigue. Despite the fact that this is the simplest form of learning, nothing is known about the mechanism of habituation. At least certainly when I started, almost nothing was known. So I started working on C. elegans. I had worked, uh, I've been progressing, progressing through phylogeny. I started with humans, I went to fish, I went to aplesia, and settled at C. elegans as something I might be able to get answers in. So C. elegans has 302 neurons. There's 5,000 chemical synapses, 600 gap junctions, and 2,000 neuromuscular junctions, and there's a complete wiring diagram available. The genome is fully mapped and sequenced. There's 19,000 to 20,000 genes. The human genome has 30,000, approximately. Uh, there's complete cell lineage for every cell in the animal. It's transparent, and so we can do neural circuit analysis and look at ongoing changes in cells using laser ablation, using GFP, using genetically encoded calcium sensors. It survives freezing at minus 80, which is wonderful. It means there's a library of mutants available that we can simply send for and they come by FedEx. And it has a short reproductive cycle. It goes from fertilized egg to egg-laying adult in approximately 3.5 days. And so when I started this work, we used a dissecting scope, uh, attached video recording equipment, and we were looking for a behavior that we could study that wouldn't have uh, experimenter bias. So rather than hand delivering a stimulus, we deliver a tap to the side of the Petri plate that the worm, the worm is sitting on agar in a Petri plate. And this is a worm, and this is the head end, and this is the tail end. And what you'll see is the worm swims forward, and the tap to the plate is like a small earthquake to the worm, and it does a worm equivalent of a startle response, which is to swim backwards. So swimming forwards, tap, and swim backwards in response to the tap. And what we do then is we play this at stop frame video analysis and trace the path of the worm. And the first experiment we did showed indeed this is stimuli 10 seconds apart and the initial, they travel approximately a worm length, a millimeter backwards to the first stimulus. And then as we repeat that stimuli, this is the average of 20 animals. The responses get smaller and smaller. If we give a brief electric shock to the agar on either side of the worm, we dishabituate. So we have uh, both habituation and dishabituation. So then we did a series of experiments working out the neural circuit for this behavior. And the behavior is mediated by five sensory neurons, two ALM and one AVM in the head of the end of the animal. When you stimulate these cells, they are gap junction to a pair of command interneurons, 
which activate a pool of motor neurons that move the animal backwards. When you touch the tail of the animal, there's two sensory neurons, and they activate a pair of two pairs of command inner neurons that then activate a pool of motor neurons for forward movement. I'm not going to be talking about the motor neurons. The next talk may will be talking about motor neurons. So the other thing about this circuit is that the sensory neurons also have chemical synapses onto the interneurons of the opposing circuit. So through a series of experiments, we determined that the most likely place for habituation to be occurring was the chemical synapses between the sensory neurons and the interneurons, although I'm not going to rule out the possibility of decrement occurring at the gap junctions. We have not studied that yet. We've been focusing more on the chemical synapses, but it certainly could also be the gap junctions. Now, C. elegans is a genetic organism, so what you want to be able to do is high throughput genetic studies. When it comes to learning and memory, there haven't been very many large screens that uh, have looked for genes because the behavior is, is complicated and the time to do the analyses uh, is prohibitive for large scale things. So for our old system that I just told you about, for each worm it was 15 minutes of testing and then to hand score the data was another 30 minutes. So we're talking about roughly 45 minutes a worm we would want to have an N of 20 for each group, and we'd want to run a wild-type group alongside each mutant. So it would take us approximately 30 hours to assess a single strain in real time, with graduate and undergraduate time. That translates into approximately a week of strain. You can't do large-scale things at that rate. And so what we did for the first 10 years was um, candidate genes. So we'd look for genes that were expressed in our neural circuit and we found some mutations that affect habituation that way. We did, I spent a lot of money trying to get um, a program written to automatically score worm behavior and um, that was, a lot of it was lost money because uh, I didn't realize what a, a fundamental problem this was, but this is a cartoon that beautifully says what the problem is. He's looking at a worm on the sidewalk. He says, how can you tell if a worm has it in forward, reverse, or is just parked? And the worm is low resolution. It's hard to tell head from tail. So this was a difficult problem in writing software to analyze this. Until I was lucky enough to hook up with Rex Kerr, we started this when he was a graduate student and uh, he didn't get it finished during that time, and then he got a job at the uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute Genelia Farm, and he finished writing the multi-worm tracker and worked with my graduate student, Andrew Giles, uh, to do this. So what Rex's idea, the problem is if you're trying to do high throughput behavioral analyses and you videotape the behavior, you're going to use vast amounts of storage space to store the videos. So instead of actually videotaping the behavior, what he would do was skeletonize the worm and save that information. So suddenly you go from zettabytes down to um, kilobytes of data for each trial. And so the other thing is, instead of now doing one worm at a time, we can do 100 worms at a time. It uh, tracks 100 worms simultaneously and then we have a whole data processing step that goes with that. So here's an example. Here's a plate with about 100 worms on it, possibly more. If we focus on a small amount of the plate, you can see there's four worms here. Here's what the multi-worm tracker does. There's the worms skeletonized. And then it tracks their movement. And in this case, orange is forward movement and blue is backward movement. So you can get... Um, uh, scoring of the data of the whole plate at once. So there's the whole plate of worms and the activity of the plate of worms. And so if we do this, I told you it took us, um, even if we score one worm at a time automatically, it's still 10 hours of strain. Manual analysis was a strain for 20 hours. And we'd only get two behavioral measures. Now, the way that we measured the data in the past, 
was we measured how far animals backed up to each tap. If an animal didn't back up, it was given a distance score of zero, and that was averaged in. So in fact, that measure takes both frequency and magnitude into account. Now, once we started with the multi-worm tracker, if we are conservative and have about 50 worms per plate, we did four plates at 15 minutes a plate, we can do an N of 200 for a strain in an hour. And instead of just getting measures of frequency and magnitude, so far we've gotten 10 measures, but it's just a matter of writing the MATLAB programs to pull out what kind of data you want. And so the first paper just characterized the multi-worm tracker, and um, that uh, was in Nature Methods last year. And I hand-picked 30 genes to look at that I thought might be implicated in habituation. This is two of the um, extreme examples. This is looking at the probability of reversing. And the black is our wild type, which we call N2, the wild type strain. And you can see this strain, ADAP1, which is an animal that has difficulty with chemical adaptation, which is supposed to be different from habituation, also has a problem with habituation. This has opened some interesting doors of studies we're going to do comparing mutations that affect adaptation and habituation. And this is a gene called TOM1, which is Tomosin, which is involved in vesicle release. And you can see the wild type response probability. And we have the TOM1 respond normally on the first response, but then drop very rapidly. So we found a couple of genes there which had my student Andrew decide that he was going to go ahead with a large-scale screen. But what to do? We spent about six months debating the best way to do that. We had several options. One is random mutagenesis, a, a forward screen. And that would help us find brand new genes. You just mutagenize a whole bunch of worms, test them all. Now, the problem with that, the downside of that, is you have to then map the genes. So you can only pick your biggest candidates and map those rather than knowing what everything does. Now we thought about a, an RNA interference screen. The problem is RNA interference doesn't always work. It's incomplete penetration. And in C. elegans, it's difficult in the nervous system and you have to use sensitized strains, which are a little bit sick. So there was a lot of reasons and you also can get off-target effects with RNA interference. So we decided not to go that route. So if you screen known mutations in known genes, then you don't have to map. There is this library available, I told you. There's um, some 7,000 strains in freezers in the Cenorhabditis genetic stock center. So we might miss unknown genes but it's less likely with a sequenced genome and a high throughput analysis. So that's what Andrew decided to do. So there was a paper published several years ago from Josh Kaplan's lab, Seabirth et al., where what they did was an RNA interference screen of genes at the um, uh, neuromuscular junction. And they had used bioinformatics to predict genes that, might, that should be expressed in the nervous system based on their genetic domain structure. And so they had over 2,000 genes that they were studying. So what Andrew did was he took that list and he cross-referenced it to what was available at the stock center and he ordered all those mutants and it turned out to be close to 700 strains. And then he developed a high throughput system. So he tested he ended up testing some 530 strains in um, a period of about two months. Now, this was 14-hour days, seven days a week, but he did the whole thing in about two months. And he gets annoyed with me for using the word screen because it turned out not really to be a screen, which you tend to think of as sort of quick and dirty. You have some simple phenotype that you look at, whereas, in fact, we detailed uh, we did detailed characterization of a lot of behavioral measures for these strains. And so we have um, some baseline and spontaneous phenotypes. So we've got body size, we've got locomotion. So what we did was 10 minutes baseline recording. 
So we got how quickly the animals move, how many spontaneous reversals, the size of spontaneous reversals. When we start, we've just moved the plate onto the tracker and the worms are a little bit agitated. So in terms of speed, we initially, initially see them very, very uh, agitated and then gradually over the 10 minutes, they slow down and relax. So we end up with a basal speed measure. So we have 10 minutes of baseline and then we start tapping. We do 30 taps, 10 seconds apart. And so in the tap, we end up, we've got speed measures for habituation, we've got probability measures, we've got distance measures, we've got duration measures. So we've got a huge number of measures. Okay, so um, if we just look at one of the measures, response probability, and we look at the range of phenotypes we see, and are called, this is the strain bow of habituation. This is the median and the 95% confidence intervals, the gray, for 10,000 wild type worms. And then the different colored lines are different mutants that showed phenotypes that were different. Now some of these, the green here, are showing wild type uh, curves. So 363 of the strains showed wild type curves. These are some examples of shallow curves. 143 strains showed shallow curves. These are deeper curves. Only 18 showed deeper curves. Now I'm going to get back to why we think so many more strains showed shallow than weak curve. So when we look at, uh, I'm going to focus just on habituation. So for habituation phenotypes, we have the initial response level, how much they responded to the initial tap, and we have a full range of hyper to hypo responsive. We've got the habituated level, how low the response is after the 30 stimuli. And we have habituation rate, which is how long it takes to go uh, from the initial to halfway towards the habituated level. That's our rate. So we have that for response probability. We have it for reversal distance, how far the animal backed up. And for reversal duration, how long it took it to back up. So for each of these measures, we have it for three different behaviors. So we have nine measures that we're using for habituation. Now, if we look at um, probability, distance, and duration, I've already shown you the strain bow for response probability. That was it. Now, the colors on the graph aren't telling you about a particular strain. They're just saying, this was our highest and this was our lowest. For distance, we get a full range of phenotypes again. But you shouldn't think that this is necessarily this. This just means this was the highest habituator and this was the lowest. They're not necessarily the same strains, and I'll show you that in a minute. And we have a full strain bow for duration. So now we have all this vast amount of data and we have mutations that differentially affect these different measures. What's the relationship between our measures? Now, the literature prior to my work was looking at habituation as a single phenomenon. But I have believed but haven't had good solid evidence that there were multiple mechanisms involved in habituation. So here is our evidence. When we correlate distance versus duration. So when we correlate the response here and here, the green are wild type and the purple are mutants. And you can see a beautiful correlation with distance and duration. Not surprising. Correlation is 0.9 something. However, the surprise came when we correlated response probability, whether the animals backed up or not, with how far they backed up. You remember, I have been putting those together in my habituation curves. And here, there was no significant correlation. Again, the green dots are wild type, and the purple dots are mutant strains. And so, reversal probability and reversal distance don't correlate, suggesting one set of genes has the animal on a given trial decide to back up or not to back up, and then a different set of genes 
is if you back up, how far do you back up? And then, I was quite surprised at this as well, Andrew also, for probability and for reversal distance, he did a, a correlation of the final level of habituation versus the rate of habituation. So that would be the final level versus how long it took them to get halfway down. And again, we have no significant correlation. So there are clearly multiple genetic mechanisms for habituation. Genes are differentially involved in four different aspects of the behavior. The level of response probability, the level of reversal distance, the rate of response probability and the rate of reversal distance. I'm not going to say that's all there are because if we came up with other ways to evaluate the curves we might find other variables but those are the four that we're focusing on now. And so what Andrew did was he made behavioral signatures for each strain. He converted everything to z-scores and with reference to wild types. So here's the wild type across 23 different variables. And then you could set a behavioral signature for each strain by comparing that strain to the wild type on each of those variables. So we ended up with a unique signature for each of the 508 strains, or 509, the number keeps changing. And then he did principal component analysis uh, I think he used um, 20 of the variables for the principal component analysis and then did something called T-SNE clustering, which I'm afraid I can't explain to you. I just know the words. He did T-SNE clustering on it. Um, and it collapses it to this uh, three-dimensional or two-dimensional image. And then if my movie would work, it would rotate and you would see that there are clusters and in continuing to analyze those clusters, this is the most recent figure Andrew had on the clusters. And so what we've got is genes that cluster together. And so he would take things that were statistically considered a cluster. And some of the clusters are, if he looks at them, there are obvious genes in it. For example, vesicles B has synapta brevin. It has a number of genes, UNC13, that are involved in vesicle release. It has some unknown genes, and then these are other genes with the same phenotype. He also has some that are he calls phenotype-based clusters. We're not sure what the phenotype is, but for example, phenotype-based cluster 2 is right here. These are tightly clustered, and these are the four genes in them. The genes in bold are genes that have known or predicted genetic interactions. So we're suggesting that this approach could be used to find new gene interactions that we didn't previously know about. So that's one thing we're doing to try to analyze the data. Another thing that we're doing, focusing back on habituation, is we took genes and we just put them into a Venn diagram based on the characteristics that they, uh, that strain showed. So we have reversal probability habituation level, that's this circuit. We have reversal probability habituation rate, that's this circle. We have reversal distance habituated level, which is this circle. And habituation rate for reversal distance, which is this circle. And then we just started plugging uh, strains in. So we had 20 strains that just affected reversal probability habituation rate. We had 12 strains that affected both habituation level and habituation rate for reversal probability. So we divided things up that way to see if we could see any patterns. And one of the things we noted was that there was many more genes in the probability than there was in the distance. At the same time, another graduate student, whose work I'll tell you about at the end of the talk, Tiffany Timbers, had noticed that she was having trouble replicating from one experiment to the next. And what Andrew had used was about a 24 to 36 hour time window during the time when the animals were egg-laying adults. We hadn't seen differences in that, in that age span before. 
So we hadn't thought that that was a problem. But then uh, Tiffany and Andrew and Evan, another student in the lab, decided to test it out. And this is reversal distance, and the red is 80 hours age, and the blue is 120 hours, and there's not much difference in distance as you go backwards. But there was a dramatic difference in probability that animals at 72 to 80 hours of age gave very flat probability habituation curves, but at 120 hours, it was much steeper. So Tiffany set about to do a very detailed analysis of this, and this, is, this side is 10 second interstimulus interval, and this side is 60 second interstimulus interval. And what you see is that for reversal distance, the age doesn't seem to matter at all. We have 12 hour intervals, 72 hours in red, light blue is 84, purple is 96, blue is 108, and green is 120. And here for reversal probability, we see a really nice, as animals get older, their habituation curves get deeper, both at 10 and at 60 seconds. Why is that? What's changing? They're egg-laying adults at all of those ages. What is the difference? So an interesting side experiment, this is Evan Ardeal, and he has adapted the multi-worm tracker to use channel rhodopsin to activate um, cells where you're expressing channel rhodopsin. So in this case, what we're going to do is express channel rhodopsin in our mechanosensory neurons. And then we're going to see if when we activate the neurons, actually depolarizing them, do we still see this age effect? And the answer is no, we didn't. Now again, here's reversal distance. No difference between our two ages. This is 72 hours and 120. The bottom curve here is the 72 hours. The top curve is 120. So if anything, it's going the opposite direction of when we tap the plate, when we use the um, touch system rather than directly depolarizing the cells. So what we hypothesized then is that the age-dependent effect was not at the level of the synaptic release, but at the level of the transduction, where the sensory neuron is transducing the mechanical stimulation. And so um, this is just to show you, remind you what the intact, the tap itself looked like, a much bigger difference in the opposite direction. So Tiffany went and talked to people in the physics department and used a laser microvibrometer to measure the uh, intensity of the tap by looking at what it did to the agar and could calibrate the tap and use different intensities of tap and then test our different age animals this is 72 hours and this is 120 hours and this is our weakest stimulus and this is our most intense stimulus and you can see at 72 hours intensity makes a real difference as we in uh, as we increase our intensity going up we get flatter and flatter curves. Now this fits uh, one of the known features of habituation in all organisms. The more intense the stimulus, the shallower the habituation. But when we get to the old animals, our 120 hour animals, they're giving us curves pretty much the same for all but the weakest stimulus. So our hypothesis from that is that there is a change in sensitivity to stimulus intensity as we go from 72 to 120 hours. And that uh, whether the cuticle is getting stiffer or thicker, we know that there are changes in cuticle with age, so that uh, is something we're going to investigate more. So then Andrew took that data and went back to his, that paper just came out in uh, Neurobiology of Aging, and so then Andrew went through all of his data and looked for animals that were delayed in development, so they'd be slightly smaller than wild type, then if they have a shallow curve, it may just be because they're younger. 
especially if that's the only variable that's, that, that's different. So he filtered all of those out of his model. So we get to take a lot of genes out. So then we end up with a model that has uh, more equity between the number of genes involved in probability and the number involved in distance and duration. And this is now a work in progress. Some of these slides I just got Friday as I was on my way here. Andrew is now looking at what each of these genes is and trying to figure out a story. So I'm just going to give you the first pass at the story. So we think habituation is a, a hierarchically organized cascade. We don't know what the starting point is. We know the second level. We know um, a G protein uh, goal one is critical at the, for three of the four features of habituation. So we have receptors, we have signaling, second messenger genes are in the next level, followed by a level that has a lot of kinases, phosphatases, post-translational modifiers. And we're thinking that the lower level, the genes that affect just a single phenotype, are things that directly affect neuronal function or transmission. So for two of the features, he's got preliminary pathways that he's playing with. So we know that a major player for many of the features, we have GOA1, which is a G protein. Oh, we have AC1, which is adenocyclase, and KIN1, which is a cyclic AMP-dependent kinase. It seems to affect both probability, habituation level, and magnitude level. So these are the level pathways. Now over on the magnitude pathway, we have protein kinase C pathway, we think, possibly MAP kinase pathway. Down at the effector end, we have AX1, which regulates vesicle release, and Fisher1, which is a neuropeptide receptor. Over on the probability level, we have a ubiquitin pathway, a number of genes involved in ubiquitination, uh, UBC16, uh, two unknown a, a ubiquitin ligase and ubiquitin hydrolase. So this is the genes that seem to be involved in the probability level. And um, stay tuned because I don't know where he's going next with this, but this is what he's uh, working on very intensely right now. Um, another directed way that we can use the multi-worm tracker is a very clever experiment done by Tiffany for her PhD. Her original work involved long-term memory for habituation, where we give space training and the animals remember habituation 24 hours later. And she was showing that that, was, uh, that required CREB. No surprise, CREB seems to be required for long-term memory in just about everything. So there's our wild type showing long-term memory. The um, tra the trained animals lower than control animals. If they have missing CREB, they show no memory. Interested in what was activating CREB, and someone had already published, Kimura had published, that CAM kinase kinase activates CAM kinase 1, which activates CREB. So she tested those genes, and CAM kinase kinase showed normal memory. So that's not involved in our long-term memory. But two different alleles of the CMK1 showed abnormal long-term memory. Now, in order to be able to remember, we figured they also had to be able to show short-term learning. So we looked at short-term learning. And sure enough, the CMK1 animals were deficient in their short-term learning. So here, the black is wild type, and the blue is the CKK1. They show perfectly normal habituation for distance and probability. But up here are the two alleles of the CMK1, and here, so they show abnormal short-term habituation. And when you put the gene back in, you rescue them. So where is CMK1 expressed? So we have CMK1 with protein, and here our touch cell indicator is in red, and sure enough, CMK1 is in our touch cells. The interneurons here are in red, and sure enough, CMK1 is in the interneurons. Now our hypothesis that we're currently testing, 
is that CMK1 in the sensory neurons is necessary for short-term habituation, and it's possible that CMK1 in the inner neurons is critical for long-term memory. We have to do cell-specific rescue to test that. So when a kinase binds to something, it uses a consensus sequence. So each kinase has its own consensus sequence. So she talked to a human kinase expert and got what the kinase consensus sequence is for CMK1 in humans and blasted the C. elegans genome and came up with about 100 strains of which there were 45 available at the stock center. So she got in all 45 strains and tested them for habituation. And then we're going to use our famous Venn diagram system again. We're going to place all of the genes on the Venn diagram. So all these kinases on the Venn diagrams and red are um, responses larger than wild type and blue are responses smaller than wild type. And here's our CMK1 in this quadrant right here. And one of the kinases that she tested, OGT1, was um, the same as uh, CMK1. Now, OGT1 is an O-linked acetyl glucosamine transferase, which is oblignac. Now, apparently, this uh, is involved in post-translational modification, and it can glycosylate, just like phosphorylation of genes you can get, or of proteins you can get glycosylation. And uh, it can occur as quickly as one to five minutes after stimulation. And in um, one published paper, there was a suggestion that in mammals, CMK1 uh, OGT1. So in this case, what Tiffany has done is she has used the multi-worm tracker to try to find kinases that interact by just simply screening a large number of kinases. So the multi-worm tracker is an excellent tool for behavioral phenotyping, and it's led us to a new understanding of habituation. I say that I've learned more about habituation in the last year than in the previous 25 years. One of the things we've found is that habituation is composed of at least four key components. First, the decision to respond or not to respond. That's response probability. And then, if there is a reversal, how long will it be? How far? Reversal distance. These measures, there's two components. Some genes mediate how quickly the response decrements, and other genes mediate the final level. A ubiquitin pathway appears to be involved in the final level of habituation of reversal path probability. KA pathway appears to be involved in the final level of habituation of reversal distance. But stay tuned, because as we analyze this data, we're coming up with more and more uh, exciting things. And so this is the work of some extremely talented graduate students, Andrew Giles and Tiffany Timbers, both of whom have graduated and moved on now. Evan Ardeal has been our Dobson. We collaborated with the lab next door to us, Casper Podnarski, a graduate student, and Kurt Haas, uh, the PI, and of course Rex Kerr for this wonderful multi-worm tracker, which is available on SourceForge and all of the software is freely available. So thank you very much for your attention. The, I, I, ex I expected uh, the um, synaptic release proteins to be critical for habituation. That was my initial hypothesis. Uh, but we do want to guard against that Tomosin curve looks very similar to EAT4 where they run out of glutamate. So I'm not sure. We're going to have to figure out ways to distinguish those two possibilities. I mean, one of the things Andrew did was we filtered out anything that didn't have at least a normal initial response, because I'm not interested in things that alter the habituation curve by altering just the sensitivity to tap. Um, any filters you can think of like that, or any ways to test it, we just, when, when Andrew Janelia Farms, he said to me, I really hope I can find more good mutations. <laughs>
And I said, oh, you're going to find more than that. You're going to find at least a dozen. And we found over a hundred. And now what, how do we sort them? How do we tease them apart? We're not interested in things that, as you say, that just break the animal in some way. We're interested in things that are particularly related to the plasticity. So on the one hand, the number of genes is quite daunting. On the other hand, if you think about LTP and the number of genes and proteins that have been implicated in regulating LTP, they're into several hundred at this point. So it's going to be a problem for all levels of plasticity, is understanding what, what's critical for the plasticity itself and what's required just to have the synapse function. I think it's a real problem. And, and also, what's a developmental effect? What made a synapse that's not as effective through development is less interesting to me than what in the adult alters plasticity. So yes, you know, we, we have way more data than I ever anticipated, and now we have to figure out what to do with it. Yeah, so what we'll need to do um, is cell-specific rescues of each of the genes that we think is critical. So probably what we'll do is pick two or three genes from each pathway and make sure, first of all, that they're expressed in, our, in the neurons where we think they are. Like if two genes are interacting, are they both expressed in the touch cells? Do they matter in the command inner neurons if you rescue them in the touch cells? So the final proof of the pathways will require some cell-specific uh, rescues. And it's a, it's a tool that we have. Uh, I have a graduate student working on rescuing GOA-1 right now. Uh, the question comes is, what if our cell-specific rescues don't rescue? Um, we're going to have to expand our circuit. Our circuit was done through laser ablating single neurons, but we didn't do every neuron in the animal. We did the obvious ones by connections that were one synapse away. But there may be genes. For example, uh, an earlier paper we published showed that dopamine alters habituation. There is a D1 type receptor on the touch cells. Dopamine does not synapse onto the touch cells, but it releases dopamine endogenously. And dopamine alters habituation, but only in the presence of food. So if there is E. coli present, then habituation is different if there's no dopamine, and we figured out the pathway how dopamine modifies cell excitability. So in addition to the basic things affecting habituation, there's going to be modifiers like dopamine that we can't get at through synapses. There's a lot of neuropeptides that may also affect it. So yeah, um, simple form of learning, simple animal, eh, not so much is my conclusion at this point. Okay. Thanks, Kathy, and uh, if there are no more questions, we'll move on to the next speech.